see how we're feeling as we land here. Like, see how your body's feeling. See what you notice. I always like to see who's here. See if I recognize anybody or if there's some new friends. I'm just going to look through and take a look. The faces, feel free to do it with me if you want to turn your camera on for a minute. No one's ever going to see it. You won't be recorded unless you talk. Oh, hi, there's a familiar face. Beautiful faces. <laughs> but love, love seeing all of you. So lovely. Ah. Oh. Someone's here who painted this brilliant thing behind me. Love it. Can I say your name out loud? <laughs> Mariela, Mariela Costa. She, she's the creator of that incredible piece there. I love it so much. It gives me so much resource. Thank you, my love. So let's see for a moment. Let's just settle into our bones and see what wants to present itself here. And this is a one hour community weaving and I, I never know what's going to come up. Sometimes I come in with a really distinct piece I want to teach. I don't have that today. So I'm going to pause and, and hear from you what your intentions are. And then based on those intentions, I'll take us somewhere, right? Wherever my body goes. So I want to ask you to raise your hands and to just share one sentence of what you're intending to experience here, why you're here, even a question you have, anything. We're just going to do a couple minutes of that. So literally like 15 seconds or less, we can get enough people. And then based on all that, I'll put it together and I'll begin. And um, if you are new to our space, I first and keep your hands up, everybody, those of you that want to want to speak, I just want to orient you toward the team. Uh, Evan will be joining us shortly. But um, first, I'd like to introduce you to Marika. If you want to introduce yourself, Marika. Hi, um, please uh, reach out to me anytime if you have any questions. Uh, yeah, I'm an assistant to Elise and this is a, happy to see everybody here today. And Camille Leek. Hi, everyone. I am an assistant teacher here at HLN, so I will be chiming in from time to time. Um, and you can also DM me in the chat if you have any questions as we're going through today's um, session. And then Evan just dropped in. Evan, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Evan. I'm the admin assistant here in tech support at HLN. So if you have any questions, um, and if you send any emails to me, um, to the info at, that would be me. And you can always send me DMs and chat um, during this meeting as well. So if you look down at your screen, it says chat, you can send a DM directly to Marika or Evan. You can also send one to Camille, but she's usually either helping me teach or she's calling on names and kind of checking out the faces here. So if you, if I prefer you to chat with Marika or Evan so they can, you know, take care of you a little quicker any questions come up or if you want to ask something without being seen these are recorded they do make it to our podcast at some point so if you share something you will be heard or seen again okay so just make sure you feel comfortable with that and that being said we're just gonna do a couple minutes short brief drop let us know what you're thinking Camille will call on people in uh, disorganized order All right, uh, let's get started with um, Forrest. Please come off mute. Thanks. So I had some caffeine today for the first time in a month and I'm like regretting it. I just feel so like overwhelmed with the sensation. I'm like, oh, that's bad. So I'm just hoping to co-regulate. Thanks, Forrest. Uh, Savannah. Hi, um, yesterday I released some rigidity I was having about some just beliefs about myself and some relationships and even like some morality. And I was just having a lot of stuckness that I didn't recognize. Now that I have, I'm feeling lighter today and I'm just wanting to integrate that. Um, I had a big migraine yesterday after that. So that was crazy, but I moved through it. So here I am. But yeah. Thank you all so much. Thanks, Savannah. Mariela. 
on mute on mute hi um i guess um mostly I, i'm here for grounding a little grounding and like i guess i would call refreshing refreshment or feeling refreshed or so but uh curiously enough since yesterday all the way till 10 minutes ago it's been like an avalanche of situations that i've had to constantly and i just wanted to say how if it had happened maybe five years ago i'll be completely freaking out right now so i think this whole thing has been part of where i'm at right now and being able to to be here in this state you know and not freaking out and um but i still really want feel like i need the grounding and the reconnection and refresh yeah got it thank you mariela gracias Christina. Um, I've been going through a, a book called Discovering the Mother Wound and have kind of like unearthed a lot of um, pain within myself for like my inner kiddo. And I also have a daughter who's five. So I have like a lot of competing emotion in my body that tends to immediately go to my mind. So really, I'm just hoping to be more grounded in my body so that I can feel and process and move through that because I tend to immediately create distance from my own pain and try to fix what I'm doing wrong with my daughter instead of feeling and moving through my pain. Love that. Thank you, Christina. Um, I'm going to ask for you maybe one more, Camille, and if there's any in the chat, you can present those as well. Uh, let's do Cecilia. Good afternoon. Uh, Cecilia is seeking calm and replenishment. Thank you. Thank you, Cecilia. And just checking in, Marika, anything in the chat you want to present? Um, yeah, I had a couple that were around the same thing, which was um, moving through over overstimulation of the nervous system and mm -hmm. how to uh, metabolize, um, you know, get that, how, how to move that charge. Great. Evan, anything you want to present? No, nothing right now. Okay. Camille, anything come through you? No, nothing at the moment. Great. So I, I felt... So the three things I think are really important, and they actually touch on what everyone shared, but um, when Mariello was talking about the avalanche and how in the past it would just like bowl her over and now she's able to move with it. And then I love how Christina was saying, I want to ground into my body. And then Marika read a couple people's requests or pieces around overstimulation. I think what I want to really sit with is the idea of embodiment. Uh, we talk about this a lot in our membership space, and I want to talk about it in this public space so people can really hear it and, and work with this. The term embodiment, or even the idea of somatics, tends to be overcoupled with peacefulness. And I really want us to notice that, because when it's overcoupled with peacefulness, there's an expectation that if you're not at peace, you're not doing it right, or you're not embodied. And that's just not the case. Embodiment means I feel whatever is happening in my body. Whatever is happening. There's a huge palette of, of possibilities. There's joy. There's pleasure. There's grief. There's guilt. There's anger. There's pain. Dissociation even. All these can be experienced. Numbness, right? So I, I want to start this session off just with the exploration of what it means to embody. That's one compared to, I only want to embody the convenient, comfortable sensations. Okay, right? So let's just feel that for ourselves for a moment. Reflect on that. How much have you overcoupled or find yourself in the habit of overcoupling embodiment or somatics with being in a state of peace or ease? Right, even the idea of being grounded, being grounded into what? Right? Do we think grounded just means, ah, I'm at peace, I'm still, I'm calm. You can ground into hatred. You can ground into sorrow. You can ground into anything. And the way I like to teach and practice somatics is just that. What's alive for you right now 
It's not always what you want to be, but what's alive for you right now. And let's practice grounding into that together. So a, a real radical acceptance of what's in the body and a meeting it or relating to it. Neil, do you want to riff on that for a moment? Yes, yes. No, this, this, um, this really resonates with me. It comes up a lot. When we think about embodiment, we can also think about it in terms of regulation. And just like Louise was saying, we can often think, well, being regulated means being calm, being settled all the time. But regulation actually is not a steady, static, fixed state. Regulation is actually activation and steadily. It is the constant wave, it is the constant ebb and flow of activating and settling, activating and settling. So we think, we can oftentimes think regulation or being embodied is just this all the time, but it's the constant ebb and flow back and forth. And what's interesting is if we don't have the ebb and flow, we just have the down, that's what we experience as depression. That's what we experience as collapse. So when an animal plays dead or when our bodies even go into playing dead through collapse, it's like a flaccidity where you lose the firmness of your activation, which lets you have agency, expression, tell your boundaries, speak your, your sound, your voice, be seen. That agency collapses is why it's called collapse. And there, that inability, that firmness of the tissues and muscles is gone. So that's the one extreme. The other is what uh, Marika was saying, the overstimulation. When the body doesn't have the ability to downregulate, it's just up here and we experience panic, we experience overwhelm, we experience dissociation. So a regulated body is not a calm body. It's a body that's really fluid and flexible and moves between being heightened and going low, but it doesn't stay in one of those. That's what's so cool about it. It's, it's fluidity. It's a constant movement up and down. So what creates imbalance isn't stress. It's fixed stress. When you have that biology, okay, rewind, stress and trauma. Okay, let's, let's talk about that first because everyone's like, well, what's the difference? There really isn't much difference. I'll tell you why. Stress just means the body's able to metabolize it, okay? So the biology is the same. And what I mean by the biology being the same is that stress and trauma both have a biology rooted in adrenaline. So there's a large amount of adrenaline being created, which increases your blood pressure, constricts your veins, makes your heart speed up, makes you a little more focused, and lights up your nervous system, that rush we feel, that buzziness, right? That comes with a stress response, that comes with a trauma response. What makes something stressful instead of traumatic is the body has the capacity to be with it. It can manage it, it can move through it, it can absorb it, it can metabolize it. When it hits a point where it's beyond the body's capacity to metabolize that physiology I just talked about, the blood pressure can come down, the heart rate doesn't settle, the muscles don't relax again, that's when we start going into a trauma response. So chronic stress can create PTSD, just like one huge, you know, catastrophic event can create PTSD. That's why I, I teach trauma healing and stress healing through a lens of not what the event is, but how the body responded to the event. Okay. So when I say stress and trauma, that's what I'm talking about. I don't even know how I got there, but let's just stay there. Let's just enjoy that for a moment. So when we're talking about overstimulation, we're talking about grounding. You know, we're talking about being with the body and the flexibility that Camille brought in. Flexibility means I'm getting stressed and then a breath came in. I'm getting stressed and I stretched my arms. I'm getting stressed and I sat down and held myself for five minutes. I'm getting stressed and I ate food that settled my nervous system. So there's the stress. And then we feel it and respond to the stress and the stress settles, right? This is happening. So it's the fixed, that's how I got there, the fixed stress. When you're fixed in a stress response, you're in a biology that's adrenalized, which is very similar to a trauma response and to PTSD, biologically speaking, biochemically speaking. So let's just pause there so you can feel that, just to catch up to that. Whether we're talking about stress or trauma, we're talking about the same biology, same, bi same things happening in the body. 
The only difference is one, the body can handle, the other, the body can't. So what happens when it crosses over into trauma response? That's when we leave, we exit, we dissociate. We don't have a relationship anymore. Can't really feel. We can't really feel where we are in the room or where we are in time. We can't really connect to people. There's an isolation that occurs that we don't choose. It's called dissociation. And it's, a, it's actually a benevolent gift. It's designed for when you might be in a situation where you're going to die. And so you, your animal body doesn't have to feel the pain or experience the horror of death. You dissociate. It's like an anesthetic. When you're in a trauma response and it's not short term, which it's meant to be, it's long term because of a lot of maybe societal, domestic, personal, relational issues. You live in the dissociated state. You live anesthetized. So you live with the inability to perceive your surroundings or where you are. So your body stays in the biology of threat and stress and adrenaline, but your conscious mind and your ability to feel and perceive, they don't match. They're somewhere else, right? This is the beginning to understand the difficulty and the nuance around trauma healing. To heal trauma somatically, and heal, heal just really means the response realizes it doesn't have to be on right now, right? Heal just means my body realizes right now for this moment, like second by second, breath by breath, there's no threat to my life right now. Could be in 20 minutes, not right now. That's trauma healing because trauma response doesn't turn off. You're, we're born with it. We need it. We're all here because we had trauma responses that kept us alive and kept us here. The difference is these animal bodies, our animal bodies, our human bodies, don't catch up to the fact that the situation's over. It expects it to happen again, so it stays braced. So in that expectation, we stay in the biology of stress and trauma, even when in our reality, there's nothing going on. So the first thing I want us to do is pause and notice that. Look around your room or wherever you are and just visually notice visually the absence of threat. Look at your walls, look at the plants. If you're outside, look at the sky or people. Look at something that's beautiful, something you love. Now you can see it so you know it, can your body perceive it? Can your body feel it? So pause and notice that. Can your body catch up to where you are right now? Can it feel what you're sitting on? Can it feel your breath? Can it feel the temperature of the room? Just notice that. I'm going to ask you in this case to write to Camille. And just say what you're noticing as you come to the room, as you look around, what's your body doing? Is your body stressed incongruently, which means it feels something that doesn't match its environment? Is it finding ease in the environment? Is it impossible to feel? Let her know what you notice when you settle in to where you are. There's no wrong answer, by the way. Just see what your body feels. A yawn, warmth, inner smile, relief, tears, settled, unable to feel the safety because in, inside feels unsafe. It's at ease. My body is warm, almost too warm. Um, an internal tightness, a sense of urgency. Uh, it feels impossible to be with. Oh, such relief. A tingling aliveness. A rage uh, explodes. Incongruency. It feels like the danger is inside of me. I can't escape it. Almost like an emptiness. A question of like, now what? Grounded. Uh, stressed for no present reason, but relaxing as I start to notice I'm now safe. I One feel alive. Oh, okay. I feel alive inside. Mm. I'm loving, I'm hearing this a couple times in these shares about inside feels unsafe. And someone else said the danger is inside. These are really important statements, right? Because that's, that's the trick of PTSD and of you know chronic stress 
is that the, the sensation of danger, even the echo from an actual experience of danger is living inside. That's really happening. So in this present moment, you are experiencing danger inside. As you look around you, you can see I'm not experiencing danger outside, but that inner place that feels the danger has yet to catch up to your reality. So it's like time travel, you know, it, it's, it's preserving this echo of pain, this maybe unheard scream, this repressed fight response, whatever the experience is that's traumatic, the body's holding that even though you can see that you're okay. I'm saying that because how do we help this inner landscape of danger catch up to the reality that right now there's no danger. And when you hear me say that, you might think, well, of course there's danger, Luis. Have you seen the news? Yeah. Right now in your environment, is there danger? This is not about denying the reality of the world. This is about not denying your reality. Where are you right now? Is there danger around you right now? And if there's not, we start helping this part inside catch up to that through sensation. So I'm going to walk you through this. Let's locate the place inside. Now, some of you found relief. So if you started feeling relief, stay with that. Feel the place inside that has the constriction, that has the danger, the tension, the numbness, whatever it is that doesn't match where you are right now. And the first thing to do is to put your hand over that place and then make sure your back and especially your head are supported. Whether that means you sit against a wall or you let your head rest on the, the headrest of the chair, or you lay on the ground, or you lay in bed, or you sit on the couch, whatever it looks like. Some people even like to let their hand hold their head. Just feel what it's like to support the head and the back while holding this place that feels the danger. And just pause with that for a moment. And we're not looking to trick. This isn't strategy. This is just letting the body catch up to where it is. So your job is just to witness, is it catching up? Not it should, not you have to make it, but is it catching up? So notice, does that feeling soften? Does it get bigger? Does it get more numb? Does it get less numb? Do emotions move through? Just really pause to notice what it does first. We're just going to give it 15 seconds or so since we're in a, a group. And then staying where you are, Open your eyes and let your eyes take in the room as you hold this place and as your body is held. And really take a moment to focus on one thing in the room, one thing you like, one thing that's beautiful. And just see in your body where you feel that one thing. What part of your body can perceive what it is you're looking at? And again, you're noticing your body's ability to catch up to where it is. This can be diagnostic for some of you. Some of you might notice my body just can't feel where I am. Others will notice, oh, I feel my body slowly starting to enter the room. It's coming back to this moment. Some of you will feel a certain part of your body enter the room and another part is numb or feeling stressed. There's many different ways your body will experience this. One more thing we're going to do with the eyes open while being held, if you can, if not, you can sit up a little bit, is just to look around behind you. Like you look over your shoulder and then look up at the ceiling as you come around to look behind the other shoulder. Really let your body take in, your eyes take in around you and behind you and above you and see how the body experiences that. And again, write to Camille, let me know what's coming up. 
before I speak more, I want to hear where your bodies are going with this. Is your body catching up to where it is? Does that catch up include more emotion, more activation, less? Let us know what's happening. Uh, yawning and relaxed. Relief. Uh, body and brain seem to be connecting. Calm. Body is catching up with less activation. Just started crying with relief. Tears came and I was able to at least feel the unsafety. Warmth and shoulders feel activated. The shoulders drop. The body expands. More openness. I feel exhausted. I feel myself coming back to the present. Tears are flowing. Landing into familiar grief. I feel scared and overwhelmed. I feel a bit more settled. Headache coming on. I felt more relaxed, like not giving a care. I have to keep getting out of my head and doing it, quote unquote, right and getting back into my body. Anger. I just want to cry and my immediate environment is safe, but inside still feels so tumultuous. Uh, fear of losing comfort. Let's just do one more if there is one more. Okay. Um, more fear and so sad to think about what's happened to me. Yeah. That last one is really telling. So sad to think about what's happened to me. You know, it says we're sitting there, the images, the felt sense, the memory, the story, everything of what we've experienced and how that lands into where we are now. That's the real art here. Not to deny or not even allow the feeling of what we experience, but allowing it where you stand now. Someone earlier asked about integration. That's what integration really is. My experiences land in where I am now. They come together and they, they become something else as they merge. What tends to happen is our bodies brace against where we are now. And one of the reasons that is, what I find really fascinating, is when we're in these practices, and really most of the time, for those of you I can see on your cameras, we're not in an active threat to our lives. We're actively stressed, triggered, annoyed, grieving, all that is true. But we're not actively being life-threatened. And that's an important piece because these big feelings, this grief, this anger, these emotions, they start to come up because you're not being actively threatened. If you're being actively threatened, none of that's going to emerge. You're not even going to have a, a second to think about how you feel. Your body takes over when that happens. So those of you noticing as you settle and something starts unfolding like more activation, the desire to stretch, crying, anger, sorrow, as uncomfortable and unpleasant as those sensations can be, it's a, it's a testament and a sign that you're in a place of safety because your body's able to unfold because right now there is no active threat. And that's beautiful. And that's the beginning of the integration. What's inconvenient about that is there's no manual for the body. We, we try to create them. They're not real. Every body is so different that it could take you four minutes, which I have experienced and seen. It can take you four years to integrate an experience. And the beginning of that integration sometimes is a lot of pain finally surfacing if there's been numbness. Because numbness is that anesthetic, is that it's that a protective quality to help you not feel the pain because it's not safe to yet and or you don't have the capacity to. So when pain starts to be felt, when anger and grief and sensation start to come up, it's because you actually have the capacity for it and it shows itself to you. And it's because the environment you're in isn't one of threat. So I'm saying that so your mind can know that. So as you sit with this practice and you feel something big come up, and it starts to scare you a little bit, or you wish it was more relaxing or peaceful, you can remind yourself, oh, this is proof that right now I'm actively safe, or I wouldn't even be able to feel this. You might not be able to perceive the safety, but it's a good sign. It's a good thing. Pleasant thing? No. 
but it's a really great thing. Something in you is unfolding. And I often liken that to a flower, how it unfolds, gets really big and vibrant, and then it curls up and dies and transforms. That's what sensations do. They hit an edge of bigness and vibrancy, and then they soften and melt into something else. And what we've practiced most of our lives is right as we're getting to that stage of vibrancy of a sensation, we pull back out of fear, we numb out, we avoid, we dissociate, all of which is not our fault, not even our conscious choosing. It's often reflexive. So it's about building capacity for that vibrancy. It's about tending to your capacity and supporting your body to feel something really big. And this is why I almost always ask people to have their back and their heads held while they're physically with their hands holding this place. That often gives these parts enough support to experience that vibrancy, the shaking, the crying, the big pressure, the heat, vibrant sensations that actually mean you're alive. They don't mean you're going to die. It's the total opposite. You're so alive with sensation. But it's not your fault when you've been taught your whole life just by watching other people do it to their bodies and how they react to your emotions that these things are really scary and they need to be suppressed. So in the expression of something that's been tarped, you know, for a long time, for decades sometimes, there's a lot in there waiting to come out. And that can be super overwhelming. So Camille, I wonder if you would grace us with your favorite word, titration, and explain a little bit about how we navigate these big sensations with that. Yes, yes. If you're not familiar with me, titration is one of my favorite words. In fact, titration, titration, titration. And it simply is just a fancy way of saying taking baby steps. When we are learning to be with these sensations, just like Lily was saying, these can be really, really big sensations. It's part of the reason we dissociated. It's part of the reason we had numbness because they were overwhelming to the body. Remember what Lily said at the very beginning, dissociation is this really benevolent gift. And that's exactly what it is. It's a mechanism within our body that shuts on when there is something in our body that we just don't yet have the capacity to be with. Now, as we start to have the capacity to be with, it will start to be really, really intense, like a wave, but we want to tiptoe into that sensation. We don't have to feel all of it immediately. We may just want to start with feeling it for 15 seconds, and then we come out of it. And then if I feel it for 15 seconds for a few days, then I might notice, oh, now I can feel it for 20 seconds. And then after feeling it for 20 seconds for a few days, then I might notice, oh, I can start to sit with it for 30 seconds, maybe a minute, maybe five minutes, and so on and so on. So that is, I can gradually expand my capacity to be with that sensation. Being with sensation is really pretty much like anything else we do with our body. For example, if I told you today, I want to run a marathon, that's great. But if I hopped up out of this chair and tried to go run a marathon right now, what would happen to me? I'd damn near kill myself. What do I have to do? I have to train. I have to prepare my body to run the marathon. And so very similarly, we have to prepare our body to be with these really, really um, intense sensations. Hey, my friends, I created a space that is affordable, accessible, and anyone is allowed to join anytime and it's called the Library Membership. The Library Membership is an online private platform that hosts dozens of my webinars, my somatic practices, private mini lectures, and movement practices. There's also a monthly sound healing, and you'll be invited to a weekly Tuesday live mini practice with me and other participants. You'll also be invited to be a live audience member in our monthly HLN team podcast recordings, where you'll take place in the Q&A that happens off air after the episode is filmed. For more information on this membership, click on the link below or go to holisticlifenavigation.com and click on membership and then library. You can join right now and you can cancel or pause your subscription at any time. I look forward to seeing you in there. Let's pull that piece right there about training and really notice for a moment, what has been your practice for most of your life, right? Has your practice been to prepare, to support, 
to nurture these sensations to get bigger so they can move through you? Or has your practice been avoidance, numbness, shutting down these sensations? Really, really pause and, and witness that. Because you can't do something for 10 minutes if for 50 years you've been doing something else and then be angry that your body's not reacting the way you want it to. Right? It has a deep, old practice of doing the other thing. And culturally and societally, we have a practice of doing the other thing. I speak for someone in America. So there isn't a lot of um, value placed on communicating or feeling bigness of sensation. But there's a lot of value on getting through it and performing and shocking people how well you're doing after something horrible happens. There's a lot of value there. But what about valuing the life of these sensations? You know, they have their own lives. And we try to get in the way with them and shut them down. When we let them move through, they get big. They feel like they're going to kill us. It really does feel that way. And then right when it get, you get into that death place, it shifts. And you feel all this space inside of you. And that's what Camille was talking about earlier when this and this happens. It hits a ceiling and then it down regulates. But because we never learn how to let it get to that ceiling, it just hovers here and we feel anxious and buzzy all the time. Or we live in shutdown. We want to let our bodies do this, which is what they know how to do. It's actually quite unnatural the way we live. It's part of our conditioning. So we've learned how to shut this down by performing. And the most in incredible examples that almost all of us have direct experience with is um, two, three, four years old being told not to move when someone reads to you at preschool. It starts right there being told not to wiggle around in your seat, being told not to use the bathroom until you're given permission to, you're training your body to shut down its sensational instincts to move and to renegotiate and to express sensation and feel sensation. So it starts so young, super, super young, and it's very normalized. And I wouldn't even call it abusive because there's not usually malice attached to it. There can be. But for the most part, there isn't. It's people passing down what was passed down to them. So it's like a new culture that's been created. And it's one that's extremely unnatural when you compare us to the rest of the animal world. It's unnatural. <clears throat> Other animals shake. They spit. They throw up. They make sounds. They do things that are inconvenient that we would see as really weird or gross to allow their body to move through sensation. And so these animals that have been studied that live in the most threatening conditions that we could never even imagine, they aren't living in an adrenalized state because they're able to do this. They're able to feel the now. They're able to catch up to right now it's over. Right now it's not happening until it happens again, right? And that's just because these nervous systems, they just know how to do that. That's what's so cool about it. So the more you practice it, the more you, you're actually practicing a remembrance, an ancestral memory of this nervous system knows what to do when it comes into contact with stress as so long as we move out of the way and become the witnesser rather than the dominator. We relate to these parts rather than dominate them. And they do their thing and we live our life and it's a really abstract, strange, fun experience. And it makes you weird, I promise you. <laughs> it will make you very weird. So you have to get okay with being weird. Once you're okay with being weird, smooth sailing. Smooth. And those of you who are like, I'm already okay with being weird? Okay, prerequisite. <laughs> you're ready. Uh, I'm actually feeling, you know, sometimes I do demos in these, but I'm not feeling demo today. I'm feeling like weaving. So I want to go into some uh, questioning, some presencing. I want to hear what's in your body. What are you getting from this? What are you wondering? What happened for you in the demo? Do you want to push back on something I said or Camille said? Like anything, we, we welcome whatever might be here. Uh, first, I want to check in with Marika and then Evan. Is there anything in the chat that needs to be present before we go into questions from the community here? Well, nothing for me right now. Marika? Yeah, Good? Okay. Oh, 
well, Lisa, I did have something uh, come up in the chat from several people, so I just wanted to, to, to share it here. So a question that I got from some of you is, how do I know when I'm getting past capacity or when I'm reaching overwhelm? Great question. And this goes back to what we were talking about at the very, very, very beginning, embodiment. So just like Luis was saying, if I'm not embodied, I can't know whether or not threat is present. Also, another thing that can't happen if I'm embodied, if I'm not embodied, I can't know whether or not I'm approaching overwhelm. I have to have an awareness, a felt sense of noticing the activation rising in my body, noticing the first signs of numbness, noticing the first signs of dissociation, me floating away, the first signs of shutdown. Again, I'll sort of take it back to, to another physical example, like doing yoga. No one can tell us the, if we're doing a yoga move right or wrong. We have to know, oh, what's the difference between me experiencing a deep stress, a stretch versus me experiencing sharp electrical shooting pains? And then I know, okay, yeah, I'm going past capacity. But again, I have to have an awareness. I have to have an embodiment of that to sense it. That's right. So just notice that for a moment, how your body tells you when you're able to feel those little signals, those subtle cues. And if you've been living in the practice of shutting the body down or avoiding, your body lives with a lot of numbness. So it's really difficult to feel the subtle cues and you're dissociated when you're experiencing numbness, really difficult. So part of it is supporting the body to just start feeling. And then when you start feeling, it's super uncomfortable. So you think something's wrong when really something's so right, you're perceiving your body and what's around you. So subtle cues when you first start feeling can seem not so subtle, they can seem really uncomfortable and painful, but they are the way your body shows you when you're at your edge and you need to support a part of yourself. So that being said, let's move into questions. If you don't want to ask your question out loud, well, I would say there's a couple options. You can ask your question with your uh, camera off and even change your name. That's one way to do it with your voice. You can ask it with your camera on, or you can send your question to Marika or Evan. They'll chime in and ask it for you anonymously. And Camille will always prioritize people we haven't heard from yet, but keep your hand up if you've already spoken. Sally, please come off mute. Hi, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Luis and the team. It is such a joy to be in this space. Um, wow, that really like shifted something in me listening today about um, how there's a difference between regulation and the undulation and how we're supposed to go, how we can move up and down. And for me, I've always had regulation be this like, kind of like, I gotta stay in this space. And I've controlled and numbed and you know, I've, I've moved through the mental health system myself and I've been diagnosed with bipolar at one point in my life. And I've been in spaces where I've been really fluctuating and playful and like the capacity to feel and the capacity to be with the sensation can be really big sometimes within my own system. And it's like, wow, you know, it just felt for me like, wow, there's this whole like backwards thing going on where this gift that I have to be in sensation and to fluctuate has been so misunderstood and so controlled. Um, and it's almost like an extreme of what society is doing in general that you're talking about from, you know, as we're little and we're just trying to sit still and we're just trying to be some form of domesticated to fit in. And, um, Give you a time yeah. check. So. It just felt really liberating, but I'm just curious your thoughts and this this liberation of the fluidity versus the regulation. I just want, I want to reflect that again so we can all hear that. I, I like that phrase of like a liberation with the fluidity. I, I too find it really liberating because if you think that embodiment or peace or healing just means you have to be flat all the time, that's such a heavy burden that will create its own stress. Because you'll be walking on eggshells around your own experiences. Whereas when you know your body has the capacity to be fluid, to feel the bigness of pain, and then to feel the depth of like silence and stillness, and it can go back and forth, that is super liberating. 
because as life happens, life is so highly sensational, right? So you're able to navigate almost like a river around all these experiences with life. And that that's for me, the real liberation. Liberation is not that a bad thing stops happening because that's impossible. Liberation is I have the capacity to meet the bad thing that happens because now I know I can go to these highs and lows in my body with, with a greater flexibility. So I just I just appreciate that. And I, I'm, that's that's my response to you is I just love that. And I think that that is what the, the freedom really is. So thanks for bringing that, Sally. Uh, Janine, and please correct me if I mispronounce that. That was right. Um, thank you all. So as I'm sharing, I'm feeling both this warm connectivity and joy in my arms, my heart, and my belly, because I'm so happy to be with you all. And I really need that warmth and connection. And I'm feeling terror in my heart and my belly. And that no, 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 no. I don't want to be seen. I'm not safe. Um, and I'm finding for myself that sh speaking them, speaking them both, creates that spike of vibrancy of both or allows it to be liberated. And as I stay with it, there's a, there's a level of blending that happens between them. Um, and I'm with that, I'm curious about uncoupling love and the impulse for pleasure and connectivity and like moving forward and opening with terror and shame. Yeah, really just really beautiful stuff you're giving us. Um, I'm loving this this piece around. So when you said impulse, I want us to think about like liberty or liberation and impulse. Because when you feel like you said that as you speak to them, it's the vibrancy gets bigger, gets more sensational, has more, you know, to, uh, color even to it and texture. Uh, that's the liberation starting to happen. Now, what happens here is as this part in me unfolds to be seen by me, that's kind of the first step. Like we all feel that feeling this thing big is rising in us. Like we notice it for anyone else. It's liberating itself. It's manifesting itself. It's, it's making itself appear to us. Now, the next step, that, let's call that activation for the sake of this piece here. The next step is activation is always the earliest stage of movement activation is what animates the body like when you feel a shock and you laugh or you scream or you cry activation animates us it's what lets us have agency and movement and, and physical expression that then people can see so there's this one layer of i'm witnessing sensationally activation that then wants to turn into external expression that can be breath that can be language, that can be dance, that can be crying, can be stretching, laughing, jumping, hugging, you name it, painting. That's the part that is different from us and other animals because we have these overcouplings that say this bigness that wants to unfold through you is dangerous. Someone will hurt you. Something bad will happen. You'll be laughed at you'll be abandoned. There's an overcoupling with expression that happens really early when our expressions were met with something really painful over and over and over again by people around us. So the body tells a story that this equals this all the time. That's what an overcoupling is. And that's why when the anxiety, I'll call it, or the activation comes up, it something meets it and we all know that feeling where ugh, it pulls it back in. The explosion begins to implode. And we live in an implosion. An implosion creates adrenaline, but it creates inflammation because what's meant to come out is going inwards. It's like an internal impact, like a like a like a, a swallowed shout that actually starts to hurt your stomach and your throat. 
And I think this is really important as you speak to this, because that's not liberation, that's the repression, the oppression even of sensational expression. But to let impulse, which let's call activation impulse, the early stage of it, be met with expression and agency and movement, it's just liberated itself. And I'll show you what I mean, everybody. Take your hands and put them right here and just like hold them for a moment. And notice your chest and your belly. Notice any parts that build up. Notice any parts that get tight. Notice any tension in the stomach, the jaw, the, maybe the arms from holding your hands up. And then take a breath and pull them back. And then just kind of push them open and let them land to your side. And unless you have an overcoupling with doing that, you're gonna feel a huge shift in your torso. You'll notice a sensational change, maybe something opened. Maybe your breath got deeper. Maybe there's more space in your belly. For me, like a coolness ran through my chest and felt really nice and, and expansive, right? Impulse and activation is, is wanting to animate us. It wants us to move. Over couplings that are traumatic tell the body not to move because being seen is dangerous. So the body presses in on itself and the expression presses in on the bracing and there's all this friction and we're living in that inside all the time. So I don't even know if I said anything you wanted me to say, but I'm glad you took me there and I appreciate it, Janine. Thank you so much for your words and, and what you brought. Um, Mari, please come off mute. So nice to be here. Um, oh, I just wanted to bring the or name how to how to cope with what's going on in in the world and um and wanting to show up and just having the 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 gravity of it take your breath away and um make you invisible and so what comes to me now is that every time i speak an ancestor speaks because we are all ancestors in the making and so what i'm trying to say is that the the thread of a desire really takes us to higher places um and that's that's all what i wanted to share here and learning the capacity um concept uh has also helped so tremendously as well. Um, honoring, honoring, and yeah, I, I also acknowledge in that it's a privilege to honor our capacity. Thank you for that, Mari. I want us Thank to you. pause there just because of time. We're going to stop this portion of sharing for now. Because one thing that Mari just said that I thought was important to sit with is um like when she said how to cope with everything going on what what i find so interesting and it, it happens regardless of the situation even the way we started this session with the practice of can your body catch up to where you are right if your body can catch up to where you are you can witness some of the most heinous pain and be resourced because your body feels, to use that word, the privilege of its own safety, it can feel it while it watches someone that doesn't have the privilege of safety. And it feels your reality while witnessing the other reality without fully joining the reality in your body. When my body joins someone else's reality of suffering, and it's not my reality, I bypass my reality, right? And I have nothing to hold me. I have no resource. I've left the building. So I'm going to dissociate. I'm going to get very overwhelmed. And because it's not my experience, I don't have a direct way to renegotiate my safety. If I'm watching someone, let's say, be screamed at on television, right? I'm not the one being screamed at. I can't run from the person screaming at me. It's not my experience. So I'm feeling it all without the ability to directly experience it. 
when I witness that same thing from where I sit and feel where I sit, I am gifted with agency and resource. I feel the charge of empathy of watching someone's pain met with my reality. And that gives me the capacity to have a response. For some people, the response is activism. And there's many different ways that takes place. Others, the response is when I go to the store today, I'm going to be really kind to everyone that I pass. Others, the response is I'm so exhausted, I need to sleep an extra hour. So the responses are strange. They're not all direct. They're not all even in the name of saving or helping someone directly. But where the medicine goes of connecting to ourself, we can never know. It's, it's a mysterious sequence of events that takes place. The person that sleeps in for an hour is no less good to me than the person that marches. Everyone's doing what's in their capacity. And by doing that, you're having some effect in the world. What matters for me is that the body experiencing this is feeling where they are right now. Because you're of greatest service and help to people around you when you come from a resource place when they don't have the privilege of resources. But when I leave my resources in the name of compassion for your resourcelessness, let's say, I'm not helping you. I'm matching your experience. And I don't even have to. And I've been feeling this a lot lately, how in a way, there's no, almost nothing more privileged than throwing away your own privilege and denying it. And when I say privilege, I don't mean even the political term of it. I mean, like, literally, what I have that you don't. I have safety and you don't have that. I do you no favor denying my safety. So what happens if I embody my safety and then witness you? What comes from that? That's a different way of being with people and being with suffering and being with global crises. And we have two minutes, but Camille, I'd love if you want to add anything to that before we close. Um, oh yeah, so many things, but um, I'll just continue along that train of thought around the the idea of privilege, and that um, particularly from my background in diversity, equity, and inclusion, part of my practice is helping uh, people understand that there actually is no benefit to having shame or guilt about any privilege we may have. Because very much like how Louise was talking about, I like to think of privilege in the aspect of I have a responsibility. Not that I'm responsible for, um, you know, the different types of marginalization or oppression or power dynamics. These are things we were all born into. None of us are responsible for them. But what we have is a responsibility by which I literally mean an ability to respond. So when I have some form of privilege, I have an ability to respond where someone else may not. So if I have guilt or shame about my ability to respond, I now no longer have the agency to tap into that privilege, a privilege, i.e. an ability to respond that could actually help someone. That's what it means for us to be an ally. That's what it means for, for us to be an advocate. So um, yeah, I, I, I don't know if that made sense or where that was going, but that's what came up for me as, as, as I was listening to you, Elise. Absolutely. And I want to close with that. I want us to all just take a moment to honor right now the privilege of where you are right now. Like, look around. And it's going to be different for everybody. So look in your own, like, look away from the computer and look in your own room. Those of you listening to this later on in the replay, do the same thing. Look around. And just see, what do I have here that supports me? What do I have here that supports me that's really easy for me to lose when I'm empathizing with someone else's suffering, when I'm remembering my own historical suffering, when I'm expecting future suffering, or when I'm in pain now from something that just happened? All these things sensationally can hijack us from right now what is supporting me, right? What's my privilege of support, of safety? What's my reality right now of non-threat? Trauma heals, stress heals when we can feel the reality of non-threat. Even when you have pain coursing through your body, even when you just experience a horrible experience, even when a horrible experience is coming. If you can feel the current reality for five seconds of non-threat, something starts to shift in you. And that's really the magic 
of being able to perceive where you are in the room. Because unless you were actually in real time threat, right, you're able to perceive where you are. When you're in real time threat, inability to perceive, the body takes over, the mind shuts off. So if you have a mind that is thinking, if you have a mind that is imagining looking around, it's the little cues that, oh, I can settle into here with my body a little bit, even if it's for five seconds. So I want to thank you for joining me and my team today. I want to thank you for your beautiful questions and your presence. Evan put something in the chat about the next seven week course. You can also check out the website. We have a free boundary series coming up in a couple weeks. It's an email series. You can check that out. Feel free to unmute and say goodbye if you'd like, and we'll see you next time, okay?